Let's pray. Father, I praise you for, for what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. I praise you for the lives that you're going to affect, affect on this day. And Lord, I understand that you know best. And you, you know best about the word that is going to come from me. I may be a little nervous every, every Sunday, but you, God, are the best in calming me down. And I, I pray that this will speak to every heart, every spirit that will be listening to it. Speak to me, speak to me, in the name of Jesus. Hi guys. Um, this sermon today is called Trapped in a Wealthy Place. I, I guess it was, um, in my bed when this sermon came to me. Um, when the title for this sermon came to me, um, Trapped in a Wealthy Place, um, um, I, I was thinking of the scripture, the part where God says, I have, br I, I have brought you into a wealthy place, and I was thinking, um, even though, I said to myself, even though he has brought us into a wealthy place, uh, wealthy there not meaning money, but meaning, um, uh, prosperity, and prosperity in itself not meaning money, prosperity meaning shalom, uh, nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken, so, that's what I mean by wealthy. Um, nothing missing, nothing la lacking, and nothing broken. Um, so, I said, um, traps in a wealthy place. What a weird title. What do you mean? And he said, some people, right now, they're, they're in the place of total shalom, total peace. Uh, total uh, prosperity, but they are they are trapped in that place so much so that they can't see the wealth around them. Um, they can't see the the opportunity because they're so mired in in pain and in what's going on, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't be aware, we shouldn't be concerned, we shouldn't be praying, we should be all those things, but we should, he said we should not let it become to the point where we're mired in it, where all we think about is COVID, where all we think about is the job loss, where all we think about is the um, kind of um, what's going on in the world. He says, he said, I have brought you into a wealthy place. All you need to do is receive my wealth. And when I say wealth, I don't just mean money, although that is a part of it. I mean this the complete shalom of God, nothing missing, nothing lacking, and nothing broken. He's saying, I have brought you into a wealthy place, and things around you may not seem like a wealthy place, it may seem like a dark, dingy, forgotten place, but he's saying, it's an illusion. A few sermons back a few weeks ago, I talked about uh, David Copperfield and how he's an illusionist and how um, I used to love to watch him do illusions. And an illusion is 
something that looks like something that isn't really there. That's not the dictionary definition, by the way. That's the Rachel definition. An illusion is a mirage. Is a mirage. So, I'm not saying that what's going on is an illusion, but I'm saying, um... God may be using what's going on, the tragedy, the sickness, the everything that's going on, COVID, the financial crisis, all the weather things that are going on, to distract from what he's really doing, uh, what he's really putting in people, what he's really birthing in people, uh, the wealthy place that he's created out of that he's creating out of mess because um, sometimes um, th things may not seem like a wealthy place but it is sometimes the ground has to be barren before it can grow and I believe in this time now that's what's happening the ground seems barren in our lives, in our churches, in our in our society. But underneath it is a seed, a seed of greatness, a seed of wealth, a seed of a seed of glory that we have never seen before. Underneath. COVID underneath the health crisis, uh, the financial crisis, underneath are seeds of glory that we've never seen before. I honestly believe that it, and the glory that I'm talking about is much more than, than Jesus coming back. Like, I see I see people coming to Christ like never before. I see God raising uh, people up that you wouldn't think were preachers. Uh, I see God preaching in different ways. I see worship music changing. I see all of this happening um, behind the scenes. And that will... That will... Um, bring us into the wealthy place that is already there, but we just can't see it now. And wealth is something that the Lord wants. And when I'm saying wealth, I don't mean just financial wealth. I mean spiritual wealth. I mean emotional wealth. I mean financial wealth, yes, and physical wealth. He wants a wholeness uh, to come to his bride like never before. Not to say that we won't have our challenges or our difficulties, um, but he doesn't want us to live there. He doesn't want us to live broken. He doesn't want us to live um like spiritual paupers. He doesn't want us to live in broken places. He wants us to experience the broken place, learn from the broken place, and pass from it emotionally. And although um, the broken place may may be around us, we don't have to let the brokenness, the brokenness change us and overtake us. Situations can be happening around you, but it's how you react or what you do in the situation that determines your place. Some of you are sitting in wealthy places right now, but you are so focused on what's going on in the world that you're not seeing the seeds 
of glory that God is run, trying to plant. What God is using, the people God is using, the people God put in your life for you to see his glory through. I honestly believe that God wants us to to not be trapped in the wealthy place, but he he, he wants us to um, he wants us to be free. He wants us to experience a level of glory that we've never experienced before. Um, I think as the church and as society, we are so myopic. We only see as far as we can see, but we don't see beyond what we can see. And he, I really felt him saying this morning, uh, see beyond what you see. See beyond what you see and ask for my eyesight and ask for my ears and ask for my mouth in in these times. What am I saying? What am I speaking to you? What are you seeing through my eyes? And I think if you can see through the eyes of the Lord, you will know what your purpose is and he may reveal to you your part of what to do in the body of Christ or your part of how to react to this situation. Like, we feel trapped. It's like we're in a, it's like we're in a glass house, but all around us is the beauty that we cannot see because we're stuck in um, this glass house. Oh, things need to be done this way, no. Things need to be done this way. No, preaching needs to be done this way. Worship needs to be done that way. This needs to be done like this. And he's saying, I need you to break the glass house. I need you to, to, the, to break the glass house to experience the wealthy place that is just waiting for you. It's like... Um, I read this book one time where this lady was kid kidnapped and her rescuer, uh, this was a fiction book, her rescuer, after she got out and everything, went to the place where um, uh, she was held for two years. And when he went there, uh, he said, he said, oh, she could see out, but she was trapped and could move. She was locked in a cage. So it's like uh, we can see the wealthy place from where we sit, but we just can't touch it because uh, we are too afraid uh, to break the glass ceiling because we are just... We don't know, and we say we're open, but I I tend to believe that uh, we are not as open as we think we are. Because um, I know for me, um, I like change, but not too much change. And I think as human beings, we're so... Uh, regimented, we like to know what's coming next, we like, uh, we like that we get up at, um, six on Sunday morning, drive down the 401, that's a highway in Canada, if you don't know what that is, so we drive down the 401, then we t t take a left on this street, we go over this street, and then we line up 15 minutes, to get into the church, and when we get into the church, we we sing like two fast songs and two slow songs, and then there's preaching for about an hour, and then we go home. We like it regimented because we are humans. But um, I was saying to God this the other day, I'm like, 
But you're like the river. You're like the river. You always flow in different directions. Sometimes you flow here, and sometimes you flow, flow there. And we say we flow with you. Oh, but honestly, we don't. We don't. We like regimented. We like to know what's coming next. We like to know, oh, I'll get out of here by 12.30, or I'll do this by, like, 1 o'clock, or we like to know what's coming next because it makes us feel safe. And we, it makes us feel protected. It makes us feel like we're in control. And although that, that we're... We know we're not in control. We we know and say that he is in control. We like to feel that we have some modicum of control, which we don't. But we're too afraid to let go of the controls. But we don't understand that the the tighter we hold on is the more he can't give us what we're praying for. We're holding on to the old way of doing things that wasn't our idea in the first place. It wasn't Jesus' idea. It wasn't any it wasn't anybody in the Bible's idea. It, it was the people that came after Jesus that said, let's do this or let's do that and there and then we're doing some of this and that up until the today because we think it works. So it, it wasn't it, it wasn't Jesus's idea to have a preacher stand behind the pulpit. That was somebody else's idea. It wasn't Jesus's idea to have a worship team with six or seven people and sing two songs. Or three songs, or uh, too fast and too slow. It was somebody else's idea. We adopted it because it worked. It worked for the time, and it and it still works now. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm not saying having order is a bad thing. But we just need to make sure that it's his order. And we need to understand that he's always changing, always moving, always flowing. And we need not to be we need not be afraid of the current because we need to know that he's got us. And I was saying this today today because it not today, the other day. When when God puts something in place, it it's not always meant to be forever. I'll say that. When God puts something in place, it's not always meant to be forever. So, um, let's say God tells you uh, to, do, to do something for a month, one year, or to do something on a special holiday one year. When that holiday comes around again, there's no guarantees that God wants you to do the same thing as he did last year. Because he's he's always moving and always changing and and we and we don't like change. We don't like movement. We say we're open, but I'm telling you, because I see it, there are so there is so much that God wants to do, but we're so regimented in our church does this on this day and we do that on that day that we won't let him change anything or we're reluctant um, to do, to change anything because we're scared. Like, if we change things, will people come? Will people like this? Will people do that? Will we have enough budget for this if we do that this year? Or it worked last year, so let's just do it this year because it was all right last year. But but last year was last year with its different um, 
needs it in different season, but this year is this year, and God is always changing, always flowing in different directions, and he's saying, you need to flow with me, and the way you're moving, you have never been this way before, and it may be rocky, but, um, I will be with you. And he said, he said to me this, he said, the problem with uh, uh, when we first went into quarantine and the world first shut down, we, di we were dying to get back to normal. But we didn't ask, what is normal? Like, what do you want us, what we did ask God was, is there anything you want us to change? Is there anything you want us to do differently in our churches, for our families, for our lives? Quarantine would have been the perfect time not to wish for what we had before, but to ask God, what more should we be preparing for? Or how should we do this? Or if you're a pastor, how should I uh, preach differently? Or how should I um, minister to my children differently? Is there a way that we could we could um, re uh, pu uh, put the word so that it it can resonate with more people? Are there different kinds of songs we should be writing as worship leaders? We were so desperate, and we are so desperate uh, to get back to normal, is that um, that we're not asking these important questions for our churches, for our lives, and for our families. And that's what the Lord wants. He said the wealthy place is there, but he's saying that we, we need to break the glass house and ceiling to reach this wealthy place. We need to expand our minds, change our perspective to get to this wealthy place. He said this wealthy place that I have for you it's not just going to happen. It's going to uh, take a change of perspective, a change of mind, a change of priorities. A lot of people are um, are um, blaming social media because uh, things are like social media is like. Um, people put mean stuff on there, and people do this, and people do that, and people do that. And I said, God, I said, what is your perspective on social media? He said, my perspective on social media is people need to change their perspective on social media. I said, what do you mean? He said, so, he said social media is like a tool, is a tool. It's neither good or bad. It's a benign tool that can be used for good or for, or for evil. He's saying what people, what pastors, what churches need to do is ask what, Lord, what am I supposed to do with this tool? What resources does my church have beyond putting up a sermon every week to use this tool? What kind of programs, what kind of structures do you want me to put in place for that? Beyond putting up my sermons every week, which, which churches do anyway. But beyond that, how do you want me to use this tool? for your glory, because it, it's like money. Money's a tool. Money's neither good or bad. It's a tool. And it 
and it depends on how much emphasis you put on it and what you do with it that makes it for good or for bad. And he's saying, look beyond uh, for pastors. He's saying, look beyond just putting your sermons up on the weekend. He said, what more can you do with this tool? And I was like, whoa! I just like was like, my hair stood on it. He's like, if Paul had Facebook, what do you think he would do? If Peter had Instagram, oh my God, what do you think he would do with it? If Jesus had Snapchat, what do you think he would do with it? He's like, he said, I, he said, I need the church to change her perspective on social media and start looking at it, not as good or bad, but as a tool that can be used for good or bad. Because a hammer, take a hammer. Uh, a hammer can be used uh, to build a house for a family, like Habitat for Humanity, or a hammer can be used to hit you over the head and kill people. So, what can this tool called social media do beyond putting up your sermons on Sunday? Yes, we should do that, but there's more there. There's so much more that God wants to tap into using technology, social media, and all this tech stuff in the next season. And we need to ask him, as pastors, as churches, as parents, as people, how he wants to use this too for, for his glory. Guys, thank you for listening to me today. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate your support every week. I really appreciate your likes. I really appreciate your support for these uh, 10 years now. Um, that I've been preaching on social media and YouTube and Facebook and all of that. So I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Bye. Well, my turn against the wall, and it looked as if it was over. You made a way. Now I'm standing here only because you made a way. You moved mountains. You cause walls to fall with your power. Perform miracles, there is nothing. Not impossible. And we're standing here only because you made a way. And when I was saying, when I was saying that the Lord said to me, the way that he's making to this wealthy place is through a change of your mind and a change of your perspective. The thing that is holding you back from entering this wealthy place is your thought pattern. Because everything starts with a thought. A thought turns into an action, and action turns into a reaction, and a reaction can change the world, positively or negatively. When I think of this, I think of the children of Israel, how they got out of Egypt and out of death and whatever, but through their complaining and through their actions, they circled the same mountain for 40 years 
a journey that was supposed to take them 14 days to cross over into the promised land took them 40 years because predominantly of their of their thought process he's like you want to enter this wealthy place well change your mind change your change your thinking change your perspective not only on social media but on things in your life see that child that's going wrong see them as as a queen in training see them as a quick as a king in training and speak that word over them even though they roll their eyes at you even though they may be rude to you speak it anyway speak to the king inside that child speak to the queen inside that child speak the word of god over that child say you're above only and never beneath say you are a leader and not a follower say you will be a man or woman of god and you'll see over time how that child will receive that how that word will go down into that soil because words are seed and people are soil and what you plant in people will grow to life or it will kill them so words are seed people are soil and what you plant in them can grow them or kill them so speak life over that child even speak life to your friends about that child speak life over that marriage speak life over that health crisis speak life over that over whatever situation is going on in your life because it will either grow or die on your word thank you lord for your word today i bless you and praise your holy name thank you for helping and giving us tools to change our minds so that we can walk into this wealthy place so that we don't spend two years going around the same thing going in the same wilderness that we can walk into our Canaan. Our Canaan is right there. Our wealthy place is right there. All we need to do is change our thinking. And then when we change our thinking, our perspective will change. And then when we change our perspective, our circumstances will change. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. I bless you because you are great and you are God. I love you today. Today and every day. You are great. You do me red calls so great. There is no one else like you there is no one else like you for you are great you do miracles so great there is no one else there is no one else like you. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, I lift my hands. 
As I was saying, the Lord is saying, fear not about the unknown. When you go off the regiment, there's a fear of the unknown. There's not only a fear of what people will think or say. There's a fear of the unknown. Well, if I do this, um, like, what if people... 
people don't like me, where the people don't like it. But he's saying, fear, don't fear the unknown. Just trust me that I got you. And I got the people involved in the situation. I got your congregation. I've got your kids. I've got your spouse. Just walk through and know that I got you. Thank you, Lord. So, guys, I am really closing today. Oh, I've got to tell you that this is my last official sermon for the year. Next week I will be coming on, but I will be coming on uh, with a story, um, with, with a story for Christmas. And it won't be a message, it will be like um, the old school story time Sunday. And uh, where I used to make a story every week. Um, it got too much, so I stopped. But next week, right here, I will be uh, speaking a special Christmas story. And then after the Christmas story, I won't come back until January. I'm taking a few weeks off uh, just for the holidays and to give myself a break. Um, so next week will be the Christmas, my special little version of the of a Christmas story, with kind of a twist. What am I? What I'm going to do is give you the background of a famous Christmas song. I'm not going to tell you what that famous Christmas song is next week, but until next week. But be here for that. Bye. give you a hint about what Christmas Carol I will be flipping to make a story of it. So thank you guys today for being with me. I really appreciate it. Bye. Bye, guys.